we create sustainable solutions for a better tomorrow. We are Eco Engineers. A lot of uh, Eco Engineers account managers and consultants are getting the question, really, what's going on with LCFS credits? Why have they gone from the highs of $200 to, I think, around $120 today? I, I brought some of our team uh, on onto this discussion. This is the team. We recently uh, completed some LCFS and RFS and RIN fuel supply and pricing analysis reports. What what's happening in the LCFS market? is tracking what we've been saying for the last uh, 18 months, 24 months. And I don't think that's a good thing because I wish credit prices were back at $200 for everyone. But I, at least internally, it, it felt good for us to validate the assumptions and some of the models. And I think that gives us some confidence about where we think the market's going to go. What was the basis of the report and how did you go about determining where, you know, how are we going to frame up this LCFS analysis and how did you tie it into pricing? One of the great advantages we have at Eco Engineers is that we see a lot of projects. And one of the reasons why there were so many iterations is we have projects coming in and we wanted to make sure that our report captured what we thought was going to happen with the credit supply market. So we have many nascent projects, we see them from people's ideas all the way through to fully functioning facilities. Because of that, we have a good overview of the credit supply that's likely to come to the market. And when we started doing this, we, were, we, we, we kind of had a discussion like, hey, you know, hey, what's going on with the CI score for dairy, with dairy RNG? What's, what's going to happen with the, the RD supply? And each of us, each uh, director of services was looking going, well, yeah, there's going to be a lot of extra credits coming from it. What's going to happen with CCS for ethanol? Uh, and when when we started discussing, we said, "Well, how is how are we going to support credit prices when um, when we see all these surplus credits come to the marketplace?" And so we decided, "Well, we've got to figure out one where's the pressure point. At what point do we see credit prices start to fall, and where will they fall to?" And that was the point of the modeling and figuring out the elasticity of demand at different credit prices for all the different fuel types. Also, just with the number of dairy projects, the number of renewable diesel projects, the low CI electricity, those are really the, the main three drivers. Of course, everything impacts the overall LCFS market from new hydrogen projects, um, potential CCS projects, but really those three fuel types are really lowering the CI score, like with RNG and electricity, or are shipping large volumes of fuel, like in renewable in the renewable diesel case, into the California market. And so were you surprised that this happened so quickly or or is this uh was this to be expected? And and maybe just in your opinion, did COVID have any accelerating impacts on that or or is this kind of what you anticipated? And and then two, maybe how long do you think this lasts? definitely pushed the market into surplus early and it did back into deficit. I was really quite surprised to see the minus 60 CI score for average RNG for, for the last quarter that was reported. That happened a lot faster. I think I think the RD renewable diesel coming in, we, we kind of we 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 lowballed our estimates so that we the other volumes and that's going a little faster than I anticipated as well. Uh, more, of, more of those plants are coming up. Every single one of these plants are going to come online. But they seem to be coming online at, at a steady rate that we expect that they, they, to meet the announcements that were made about them. Yeah, so yeah, it's going, it's happening a little quicker than we anticipated. The whole reason LCFS credit prices are declining is there's more credits out there in the market being generated on a quarter by quarter basis than there is uh, deficits being generated. And if you think about de renewable diesel specifically, you're taking something that is 100% drop in replacement to, to diesel fuel. So a gallon of diesel fuel is generating a deficit. If you put in a gallon of renewable diesel, it's now gener generating credits, but that gallon of diesel is no longer generating deficits anymore. And so you have this snowball effect of, of uh, fewer and fewer deficits, even though the compliance curve gets steeper and steeper, when you start displacing more, more overall volume with renewables and that's going to have an impact and it is having an impact on, on overall pricing. The thing about renewable diesel is it basically takes away the deficits, whereas 
the 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 cannibalization of the RNG market with dairy gas doesn't change the deficits. Um, and EVs don't affect the deficits very much. They've got uh, with the high EER of over three, three between three and four, you're seeing minus 150, minus 160 equivalent electricity, but it doesn't displace that many gallons of petroleum gasoline. Renewable diesel displaces it pretty much one for one. So mm -hmm. yes, I agree completely. You came at this looking at developing RNG projects and what were some of the things that you were looking at when you were maybe on the other side and then also you know coming into the eco engineers team seeing all of the you know the lcfs report the, the projections and supply analysis that we're doing anything surprise you how do you think this is going to impact the rng market specifically now that credit prices uh, have softened a little yeah i think the the first thing um looking at renewable natural gas projects when when we were evaluating or when, when a developers evaluate um, you know a, a new landfill or an existing landfill conversion project i think everyone it, it pretty much in agreement and 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 realizes that the long term placement of landfill gas in california is is probably not something you're going to depend on if you're developing a landfill gas plant so you know i think for the short term lcfs is a nice um, bonus if you can get it for a few years in the front end of that project but i think that you know most of those projects are being developed and and built um really with with a dependence on the rin values and and the development of other voluntary or compliance markets and as you move into the the swine and dairy um, projects you know developers are counting on that lcfs revenue but the stacking of lcfs credits and rins helps to at least diversify that and so you know, I think the marginal projects, the ones that um, are smaller dairies and further away from pipelines and, and need trucking and, and really just make it there when you're at um, $175 or $200 and, and need all of that LCFS revenue are, are going to be the first ones that start to maybe slow in development or question. Um, but there are many other projects that, that work at $100 or $125, but definitely stress the the development economics um, on the front end of the project and and you know may slow um, some of the development on um, rushing out to get supply agreements or minority supply agreements that you're you're signing that that have the option that construction has to happen in three six twelve months um, and I think that you know supply chain and covid and and just the rush to also develop these projects has has stressed them a little bit from a time perspective. A lot of the RNG projects are just taking a little bit more time to come online than than maybe they they had hoped. Um, and then you know from a from an RNG perspective, the other the other piece of what was really surprising to me when reviewing the LCFS report and contributing a little bit is is that when RNG development is looking at California in the LCFS market, they sort of look at it um, in a in a in a vacuum of what is RNG doing to the LCFS market not really realizing the, the number of credits and the, the other projects like renewable diesel and, and hydrogen and that they elect, you know, the EV market that can, uh, you know, I think is, as you said earlier, Brad, can, can all together move the market, not necessarily each one of them independently. And so, you know, you have to remember as an RNG developer, you're not the only one that's um, looking to the California markets to, to gain revenue from the LCFS market and you're you're competing with other types of fuel that's going to get placed there and not just with other rng projects what are we what are we thinking for the next uh, couple of years for for rins in general yeah thanks brad i think the number one factor that when you're looking at rent prices is going to be the rvo the rvo really sets the requirement for how many rins there are going to be needed so the epa has proposed the rvo for 2021 and 2022 and until they really finalize that, we don't really know what that RVO is going to look like, but the hope is it's, it's going to continue to go up over the next coming years, which will make the demand for RINs, which will hopefully increase the price for RINs. Another factor with the RVO is that RIN bank carryover, and that will really dictate and change depending upon what that RVO is. The higher the RVO, the lower that RIN bank carryover, so the demand will be greater. But if that RVO is lower than what we've expected, that RIN bank carryover could carry a greater volume over, which would decrease that demand. So that could decrease prices. And, and probably the last thing that we've looked at is the cellulosic waiver credit. One thing to note about that is, you know, gas prices are really high right now. And 
typically the higher the gas price, the lower that cellulosic waiver credit's gonna be. So that could have the potential to, to drive D3, D3 RIN prices down, but we'll have, just kind of have to wait and see and see what happens with those gas prices. Where, Chelsea, you know, going forward in the next uh, a couple of years, what are some of the things we're looking for? You know, obviously setting the RVOs, um, mm -hmm. you know, what are we, are we overall, are we optimistic? Uh, where, where do we think things are going to go with, uh, with, with RINs? Yeah, I think, I think overall we are optimistic that the RVOs will increase year after year. One thing we've been hearing, which is kind of interesting is the EPA might release the next three years RVOs, which could dictate, you know, growth. And we can kind of see what that's going to look like. So hopefully, you know, that happens and we can see a greater insight, which kind of could help with pricing in the future. Where do we think LCFS credit prices are going to go? Have we found a bottom? Do we think things could have, have the potential to, to decrease a little bit more? Uh, what about, you know, short term? Where do we think that's going to go? Uh, my prediction is it will keep going down and, and find the bottom probably uh, over the next two or three years. Uh, I don't expect it to keep decreasing as quickly as it has. Um, the in the long term though I think it's the, the prospects are bright we're seeing other markets coming online and we're and surprisingly we're seeing well not surprising we're seeing the voluntary market come about and that might be influenced by the SEC with what, what they're proposing to do and I think generally carbon pricing is going to under, underscore the LCFS prices uh, in the medium to the long term. Dave, what about you? Do you think this impacts development? Um, I do think it will affect development. I think where where this will maybe drive some some uh, parties closer together is if people are willing to step in and decide what they think that bottom is. Uh, and if they're willing to take a longer term agreement and say, we're, we're willing to step in and take the risk in the long term uh, for the upside of where we think LCFS is going, projects may be more willing to, to take that and be closer together where they were maybe, you know, their opinions may have been 50 or $75 apart on LCFS credit pricing for that strike price. And this may actually bring those two parties closer together and you may see some, some longer term, you know, floor pricing or fixed pricing uh, on the LCFS placement because, yeah, you know, those uh, entities that are still placing uh, RNG in California uh, and dispensing it there want the lowest CI projects um, for, their, for their customers and their por portfolio. So, they still need development of some of this gas, but um, they might be willing to, to maybe step in and take some more longer term floors or hedges, um, you know, that developers are willing to live with if they think there's a lot more downside and want to protect themselves. And at some point, it's not going to be economical to ship liquid fuels into California at a, you know, at some hundred dollar LCFS credit price, wherever that bottom may be. Doesn't really affect RNG, as you said, you're going to ship RNG into California because you don't have the transportation costs like you do on the liquid fuel side. So at some point when we find that where that bottom would be, things are going to rebound and supply is going to stabilize. Well, I appreciate everyone's time today. Uh, if anyone wants more information on the LCFS report or the R RFS report, feel free to reach out to any of the four of us um, and we can certainly provide you more information about it. So thanks, thanks everyone for your time today. Have a good one.